Easily the most versatile knife out there. In today's video, I, Gage, am going to show you how to use your cow sword and get the most from it. The uh, Guto is good for a number of different tasks, and there's many uh, reasons for that. First and foremost is the length. Typically, a Guto is going to range anywhere from 180 millimeters up to, uh, you know, 300 plus millimeters. The knife we're using today is a 210 millimeter, which we would argue is the standard size. Next thing that makes the Guto so great is the profile or the curvature of the blade. Typically a Guto is going to have a flat spot in sort of the back third, uh, close to the heel, and is going to gradually curve up towards the tip. This profile is great because it allows us to use an up and down push and or pull chopping motion, but also allows us to use more of a rocking motion. So if you prefer to use either one of those uh, cutting motions, you'll be able to use it with a Guto, or maybe you do both, uh, further making the Guto a great option for you. Lastly, uh, kind of uh, goes in line with the shape of the profile, but the tip of the knife. Uh, we've got a nice pointy tip here, gonna make uh, more intricate work super, super easy, uh, but we still got a nice uh, bit of blade height here, so we've got a little bit of travel for our guide finger. All right, so before we get into how to use this knife, let me quickly walk you through how to properly set up your station for success. First and foremost, we need to have a stationary cutting board. If you don't have these handy dandy level rubber feet on the bottom, a damp paper towel will do. Anything that keeps your board stationary and keeps it from sliding around. Next, we need to make sure we have a damp towel on our station. This is going to allow us to wipe our knife down, keep it dry and clean and free from rust. And it's also going to allow us to wipe our board down, keep it dry, clean and free of debris. Lastly, we need some uh, Tupperware or receptacles to put all of our vegetables in uh, new, processed and waste. Awesome. Last and certainly but not least, we need to figure out how to properly hold our knife. We're going to be using what's called a pinch grip today. We find our pinch grip by finding the balance point of our knife, which is the point on which we can balance the knife with just one finger. Our thumb is going to go on the opposing side and our remaining fingers wrapping around the handle. First thing we're gonna cut up is a carrot. Let's go. So we're starting with a carrot today because it's going to help us perfectly demonstrate the importance of the claw grip. The claw grip is more so using one of our fingers as a guide to help move the knife where exactly we want it to go and keep the rest of our fingers tucked behind that finger, which is going to make this uh, super safe. So me personally, I prefer to use the middle finger as my guide finger, and I like to use the meaty part between the first and second knuckle to guide my knife forward and backwards. This is also a perfect opportunity to talk about the importance of using our knife in a forward and backward or lateral motion, rather than thinking about pushing the knife straight up and down into an ingredient. Our knife is made such that the length of our blade is going to help us make better cuts. So using as much of the blade as possible is in our best interest. Using our claw grip and our guide finger, again, we're going to think about pushing the knife away from us and letting the knife pull itself through the ingredient rather than simply just shoving the knife straight down into the ingredient. You will notice an amazing difference if you have been thinking more about pushing the knife down into an ingredient when you use this motion. You're gonna uh, feel like your knife is so much, so much sharper and better performing. Next thing we're gonna cut up is the onion. In my humble opinion, cutting up an onion quickly and efficiently is a true mark of someone's knife skills. Once you master the onion, there's little you'll have a hard time with in the kitchen in the future. So we have our onion prepped and ready to go already. We're gonna start by dicing this onion. Again, I'm going to be using my claw grip here. I'm gonna be focused on maintaining contact with my guide finger and my knife and that's gonna help me make incisions as close to the root of the onion as possible and equidistance from one another. When I'm putting these incisions in, I'm not just forcing the knife straight down again, I'm focused on using as much of the blade as I possibly can and using a slightly drawing stroke in toward my body every time I put a stroke in. Now, of course, when we're using such a small part of our blade, we're not gonna be able to incorporate a ton of motion, but as much as you possibly can is uh, encouraged. Now, this is gonna demonstrate just how nice the tip of our Guto is. You're gonna notice how easily the uh, tip of the knife moves through the onion in comparison to knives that are a little thicker at the tip here. We're gonna put a slight horizontal cut in our onion, which is gonna help uh, keep all of the onion pieces a consistent size. Now, using the flat spot of our knife, which is gonna be sort of the back half of our knife, we're gonna be using push and pull motion to make our cross cuts across our onion, which is going to produce our nicely diced onion. Moving on to the second half, 
we're going to julienne this onion, which just means to cut it into thin little strips. Again, we'd like to reiterate at this point that using as much of the blade as possible is going to be super important to, to making your knife perform at its highest level. When we're going up the mountain for the julienne, you're gonna find it very easy, but once we make it to about halfway, you're gonna find that going down the mountain gets a little bit precarious. So to avoid this problem, all we're gonna do is flip the onion onto its other side and continue going up the mountain. As you improve at this motion, you can really loosen up your wrist, uh, much like a drummer would uh, play his snare. You can uh, get really loose here and really get pretty quick with your with your up and down chopping motion. This is gonna be super important uh, to make sure your knife and finger are in contact with one another when you get up faster, uh, because you can easily lose control of your knife when you're trying to go fast like this. So keeping your wrist nice and loose is important for another reason and that's because if we keep our wrist static and, and locked in place we're not going to be able to make good contact with the board we want to use again sort of a motion that mirrors the shape of the profile of our knife and using that nice loose wrist stroke is going to allow the blade to contact uh, pretty much the entire length of the edge as you're as you're using an up and down cutting motion. Next we're going into some garlic. This is going to show us how versatile the tip of the guto is. This is going to be a little bit repetitive. We're going to follow basically the same steps as we did when cutting the onion. First of course peeling the garlic, cutting it in half, and then putting those little uh, insertions into the garlic as close to the root of the piece of garlic as possible without cutting all the way through. Flipping it around, making a slight horizontal cut, and then either using a rocking motion or an up, up and down push and or pull motion, uh, cutting across the garlic to get our nice dice. Next, we're gonna go into parsley. This is gonna show us the versatility of the profile of the guto. We're gonna be using two cutting motions when we cut up this parsley. First and foremost is gonna be that up and down chopping motion where we're gonna use the back third of our knife towards the heel. And then uh, we're gonna end up doing a little bit of rocking through this as well. So first thing we're gonna do is leave the tie of the bunch of parsley on. This is gonna help keep everything together and make it much easier to cut. We're going to come about a third of the way through the parsley and cut off all these loose ends. And then we're going to take all those loose ends and stack them underneath of our, our, of our uh, bunched up parsley here. Next, we're going to use our rocking motion and we're gonna rock through this parsley, getting it as fine as we possibly can. Next, we're moving on to the sweet potato. The sweet potato is gonna be one of the harder ingredients that you come across. Uh, it's gonna give you some troubles if you're not using your knife properly. So this is gonna really reiterate the point that we made earlier about making sure you're using the entire length of your knife. This is also when you might consider going for a longer guto than a shorter one if you plan to cut up a lot of vegetables similar to the sweet potato. So uh, when we're using our, our knife to cut a sweet potato, we're gonna try to come as close to the tip of the knife to start our stroke. And again, think about pushing the knife away from us, allowing the knife to just slowly kind of uh, ease its way into the vegetable. If you have to uh, come back to the starting position, maybe you are pushing the knife away from yourself and you've run out of blade, but you're not all the way through the sweet potato, you can just come back to the starting point at the tip here and make another long stroke until you've made it all the way through. This is gonna give us a nice flat spot for our sweet potato, keep it from rolling around and being dangerous. Cut it into uh, about like a centimeter width or like a half inch uh, plank. I'm gonna do that to the whole sweet potato and then I'm gonna turn it over and I'm gonna cut all those planks into little strips. Next, we're going to spin the sweet potato around and make our cross cuts across all those uh, strips that we've made and this is gonna give us our nice dice. So the guto is so good for this because of its length. Again, it's going to allow us to use as long a stroke as we possibly can. The other thing that makes the guto really good for this is its uh, blade height. Now, of course, on this 210, we don't have a ton of blade height here, but when you get into the 240s or even other 210 gutos, they typically will have a, a little more blade height to them. This is going to allow the sharpener or the knife maker to get the knife thinner behind the edge and that thinness behind the edge is going to create a nicer edge geometry on our knife, which is going to allow it to move through harder ingredients like the sweet potato much easier than, for instance, a shorter blade knife that is not quite as thin behind the edge. Now to show you just how capable the guto is when working with larger ingredients, we're gonna move into a butternut squash here. 
Butternut squash is very similar to a sweet potato and how dense and hard it is to cut, but the gyuto is going to have an easy time with this uh, ingredient. First things first, we're going to have to remove the uh, round bulbous part from the bottom of the uh, squash, separating it from the cylindrical part at the top. So very simply, we're going to, uh, again, think about pushing the knife away from us as we're doing this, trying to utilize as much of the blade as possible. That bulbous part we can cut in half, scoop out the innards and uh, dice up and roast just like the rest of the squash. One of the most common errors we see with Japanese knife users is trying to cut through things that you should not. One of such things is the stem of a butternut squash. These things are very hard and will likely cause damage to your knife. So instead of trying to cut through the stem, just move your knife about a half inch away from the stem and cut through that part and you'll have no issues. So of course, every knife has its limitations and a 210 is getting on the long side, but it's certainly not the longest knife you can get. If we're dealing with like a melon or something like that, which is super, super large, uh, the pinch grip is going to, uh, you know, take up a good part of your blade here. We're, we're kind of, um, giving up about an inch of our blade here. So in order to get around that, when you're cutting larger vegetables, you can uh, actually choke down on your handle a little bit. Now, this is not as safe a grip to use, and that's why they don't teach you to hold a knife like this, because we don't have as much control over the blade with our hand further away from the tip. However, if we're cutting like a large ingredient, like a melon, we kind of have no real choice. So choking down on the handle a little bit is gonna free up the entirety of the blade for you and make it easier to uh, deal with larger ingredients. Now to show you just how versatile this knife is, we're gonna do a little bit of butchery with it, both of a rainbow trout and of a chicken. Now we'll start with the chicken. Uh, of course, typically I would use a petty knife for this task and I have a petty knife at home, so I typically don't use my gyuto for this, but there are certain circumstances where I'm just too lazy to reach into my drawer and get the appropriate knife for the task. And honestly, the gyuto is pretty, pretty adept at, at breaking down chickens as well. Uh, like we talked about already, we've got a nice pointy tip here, which is gonna allow us to get in between joints and around bones with relative ease. We've got a nice long blade, so when we are uh, taking the breasts off, when we make that first initial cut into the uh, into the breast, we can make a nice long drawing stroke uh, and and part that breast from the carcass with little waste and with uh, without having to saw it off and getting that weird shredded looking breast. This is also gonna help you get that nice perfect tenderloin if you're making nice uh, clean and consistent cuts. So if gyuto is good for breaking down chickens because of its tip, uh, gyuto is also good at breaking down fish because of, its, uh, because of its length. So when we're breaking down a rainbow trout, for instance, I'll typically go in behind the gill and then just make one long cut along the spine to fillet um, that, that flesh off. And having that nice long blade is going to allow me to make one single stroke and not have to saw through the fish too much. Moreover, once we've got that fillet off of the fish and we have those little straggling bones or maybe a couple pieces of weird uh, flesh that remain, we can again use nice long strokes of the gyuto to get nice consistent slices of that waste off of our fish. Finally, we can uh, flip this fish over onto the skin side and just make some little uh, incisions on the back. This is going to help your fish cook more evenly and help you keep that skin nice and flat and get a nice crust on it. So there you have it guys, the Gyuto. Hard to argue that this guy is not the most versatile knife in the world and one that we would highly recommend to anyone looking for their first Japanese knife, whether you're a home cook or a professional. If you liked this video, make sure to slice that like button, subscribe to our channel for more knife related content and until the next video, Stay sharp.